Funding for Artloft was made possible by Friends of Art and In the Florida Keys in Key West, every night is a spectacular show. And every day is another masterpiece. Hi, I'm Jamani Anamdi, and from the studios at South Florida PBS, this is Art Law. Welcome back, I'm Jamani Anamdi. Now, this week on Art Loft, we check out stunning stories in the visual arts from some real heavyweights. First up, the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami returns with a film on Richard Tuttle. Now, throughout a career spanning half a century, Tuttle has investigated our shared experiences through color, line, texture, shape, and form, just using a variety of media. In his live presentation from the event series ICA Miami Speaks, Tuttle explored the nature of his own art and the essential vitality art can bring to us all. Richard Tuttle. Check it out. So, um, <clears throat> uh, I am I am so pro uh, for uh, original, um, uh, you could say first generation uh, um, art, uh, and um, so it's worked out that I'm now about to install an original <laughs> artwork uh, that uh, was made. Mm, you know, 13 years ago, I guess, and it was um, a part of a, a, a group of works uh, that were called Red Blue. And um, <clears throat> that uh, first on the wall goes a, a panel. Uh, something like like this. I mean, very much like this. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the there's a, a number of of operations going going on here. But one of them was this uh, notion that can human beings see beyond the limits of the human being. This. Um, sort of uh, kind of crazy off-kilter uh, format uh, allows a three-inch uh, square to take place in the, the center. And that, for me, was a kind of window. Uh, and there were, um, a, you know, considerable amounts of work. I was just uh, telling, was talking to one of our wonderful young artists in Miami, and. And I was saying that <clears throat> what's terribly cool is when you know you can in a single artwork you can achieve a personal agenda as well as an impersonal agenda. You could say what I just described is a kind of personal agenda, uh, but there's an, an Im impersonal agenda. Um, would be that these, uh, this body of work was uh, addressed to digesting uh, the experience of 9-11 and having lived virtually underneath the uh, towers that collapsed. And the uh, idea being that, um, you know, people, human beings were vaporized before they could prepare for the next world. Uh, and that those of us who were that close to ground zero 
uh, had om almost like a uh, ethical responsibility as witnesses, you know, to act in a way that could, as it were, allow those spirits to uh, prepare for death even though they, they, they could not themselves. So, um, um, I am uh, uh, going to walk over there and, and put up this piece. I won't take a microphone with me. It will take just a few minutes and, and perhaps that uh, uh, sends a message or shows that I'm committed to the individual uh, or, uh, and uh, I might say to the mystic as well. See that? See that vaporized spirit finding their way to heaven? <laughs> okay, might as well start with uh, color. <laughs> is uh, is a, is a subject which I feel is by nature open, and every body of work I make defines color in another and new way I've never defined color before. And when, I, when I'm looking at this slide, I see what's going on here is, I'm, for the first time, I'm playing with the two color systems. You know, one represented by the brown, which is like a, uh, you could almost say, a, like a psychological um, color, which is um, on, say, like a spiritual level, uh, 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 love, and then the uh, the flesh color is a color system. It's about movement, and as as a work of art, the contradictions. You know, because like, I always feel that uh, why we need art is because we have to have something in the world the world doesn't allow. Uh, when stuff comes into the world, it divides into this and that, and like, and you can't, in, in my talk I said, well, why do I want to speak when I know I cannot? Because what I want to say, I, I have to be able to say two things at the same time, and I can't, you know, nobody can, you know. So, um, but in an artwork, I can, I can talk about uh, the complexity of uh, love uh, in uh, the availability of love where I'm, I'm if you saw this in the actual world I think uh, you would experience this a kind of a, a movement of just the color the surprise of it or the, why it's worth looking at or why it's a picture is because this color uh, per se flows over the brown and you must assume that there is some kind of unity somewhere in the world where those two sets of color definitions, expectations and, um, and human emotions uh, can find uh, unity. Mm -hmm. 
And in the world, uh, we, a, a lot of our grief comes from disunity, or we feel, we don't feel unified with our friends, you know, or with the systems or whatever. And the, the poets and the creative people, whether it's theater or novels or whatever, have, uh, you know, shown us that, you know, uh, we need art. Art is there for us to turn grief into um, uh, music. Um, and that uh, we can feel uh, in one very simple created work, we can transform from a profound level of grief into a profound level of happiness. Coming up on Art Loft. But that was with chemical photography, and chemical photography, you have to print it all and things. And uh, now with digits, well, you can do all kinds of things. Architect Terry Welker's large scale kinetic sculptures dramatically transform the space they occupy. They're made from materials like steel, aluminum, copper, and bronze, and I'm sure lots of love. These graceful mobiles come alive with elegant near misses and chaotic soft collisions. Join us as Think TV from Dayton, Ohio presents this dramatic profile. I'm an architect sculptor. That's what I do. I make art and I find a way to integrate it into the places that we live. Most of my works begin as part of a series. Usually they begin as experiments. I begin to play. I just am trying things. There's a high failure rate, but eventually things unfold with that. Usually I'm using very inexpensive materials and as I unfold those ideas, I began to formalize it somewhat more to create a larger piece. And then, if things are really working well, it turns into a series. I'm fascinated by the sense of natural order that we find in plant forms. I'm also pleasantly surprised and envious of the ability to create a sense of chaos. And so, I'm always floating between those two worlds of creating something pure and abstract and beautiful in a certain sense, but also trying to engage the messiness of the world at the same time. So playing with order and chaos is a constant battle for me uh, in my own art. Sometimes in the studio, happy accidents occur. I will find a scrap of material that evokes a memory for me. I found a long, slender shaving of bright green material, and it reminded me of the color of grass on a summer morning with the dew on it. When the sun hits it, it's almost a yellow-green. So I tried to figure out how to make a mobile as light and as slender and as minimal as I could. How do I make something not to mimic grass, but to evoke the feeling of grass through color and form? So it's not a direct adaptation, it's really an abstraction of that in order to make the sculpture. The consent began with a long time fascination I've had with ginkgos. There are a lot of ginkgo trees in the Dayton area and so I'm always observing these leaves, partly because I love their color, I love it every year when they fall. I'm the guy with the plastic bag scooping them up so I can spread them out in the studio just to look at them and study them. It's become an iconic shape for me. I had this opportunity for an installation at the Rosewood Art Center, and I enjoyed the idea of taking that shape and making it as large as I could within a sculpture. And I wanted to fill a room with a sculpture that would be an experiential event, because when you see something in mass, I want people to sense it with their body, not just with their eyes, but really to experience it in a larger way. But I also related to this wonderful poem by Howard Nemiroff, where he tells the story about how ginkgos, almost by consent, drop their leaves all at one time. I thought it was important in that space, too, to engage children, so I created this big, massive pillows in the shape of ginkgo leaves. 
Public art seemed a natural thing for me. Maybe it's because I'm an architect. I do lots of gallery shows, but the public art seems to be more significant in the sense that it's made for a particular time and place. Size and scale is really critical when you're working with sculptures inside a building because if it's too large, it's gonna feel crowded and out of place. If it's too small, it gets lost and feels diminutive. What you want is this sort of perfect sense of fit so that you couldn't imagine the place without it. So you feel like you can enjoy the work and engage it without being dominated by it. Fractal Rain for the Dayton Metro Library downtown has evolved over time. It started off at one size and now it's actually stretching out. It's gonna be about 35 feet tall and stretch out over a length of about 100 feet on two long giant cables. The rain portion of it will be comprised of six foot long wires that are made of stainless steel. And each six foot long wire has a six inch long prism. When you combine all these together, there will be 4,000 wires and prisms that comprise the sculpture. So the appearance is one of a gathering and waning storm. The memory that's evoked by this helps us to remember that as beautiful as rain can be, it can also lead to flooding, which is a big part of our history in Dayton. People are always surprised by the ability to make things balance. It's a really tricky business. An eighth of an inch here or a tenth of an ounce someplace else makes a big difference in form. Because when I'm balancing things, I'm not just looking at the forms and whether they balance at all, but I'm looking at the size and shape of the spaces between the forms. A good friend of mine has asked me to consider helping out at the STEM school. And when I'm teaching students, they're usually surprised how difficult it is, but also pleasantly surprised by the fact that they can actually learn how to do it. One of the things that's unique about teaching an art class is that it's unlike a math class where you have 25 students looking for one answer. We have 25 students looking for 25 answers, and that's fun. People are often surprised that I don't draw these in advance or that I don't use math to make them. It's really a completely intuitive process. I'm working three-dimensionally the whole time because that's the only way that I can really determine how the final behaviors and compositions are gonna unfold. And I might start one direction and change completely midstream. Sometimes it ends up being a dismal failure and I have to start all the way over from the beginning, but that's okay. I always say that there's as much on the floor of the studio as there is in the air. That's just the nature of the process. Next week on Art Loft. I'm Steve Gomf, and I go to thrift stores, buy a bunch of crap, and I glue it together and make it look like it is an antique television from the 1800s and people believe it. Artist David Hockney never stops reinventing himself. After years of working with the camera, he created Pear Blossom Highway, a work that some refer to as the haiku of chemical photography. Now he's experimenting with digital photography and portraiture. Here's a look at the latest work from PBS SoCal in Los Angeles. When I came back from New York, I'd, I was very excited because I'd seen uh, about a thousand paintings by Matisse and Picasso. Uh, I saw the cutout show at the Museum of Modern Art, the Cubist show at the Met, and the big ones at, in Lariga Gagosian and Pace and uh, 
I came back on the Sunday night and on the Monday morning I was painting away. I mean, I just get excited by things and work. I mean, all, all I do here is just work, really. I don't go out much because I'm too deaf to go out, really. He picked up portraiture again, which he hadn't been engaged with for eight years. Painting friends and drawing friends, people coming to the studio. This was a starting point to settle down. But it became a body of work, of course. The starting point then with, with people got him involved obviously with the space of the studio. So the next step was to really start putting the paintings up as they were made. And so the group paintings you see upstairs are people actually gazing initially at the paintings. There was a whole body of work that dealt with people standing in the studio, gazing at the paintings as they unfolded. And that then opened up the idea of the studio itself being the space he would be preoccupied with. And then uh, I painted the card players, I began them. And then uh, I did photographs of the card players. And that, they took oh, two weeks to do. Um, but uh, I thought they were very exciting, I did. Uh, they're very 3D, really. Uh, and I know how it happens, uh, I think. Uh, it's due to uh, different perspectives and things. You know, I tried to do this uh, oh, in 1985 with Pear Blossom Highway. But that was with chemical photography and chemical photography you have to print it all and things. And uh, now with digits, well, you can do all kinds of things and perspective gets freed, I think. That's what I think I've done, freed it, yeah. Um, um, but look at the marks in the painting. Again, if you look at our um, announcement of the show, you see this in the studio in a different state. Mm -hmm. Then you see it reproduced as it is painted. So he's adding, he decides, well, we need an object here. He puts it in. And in painting, of course, you can do that. But so you can with digital photography. So we take this subject into perhaps the most iconic image in the show, one could argue. Um, and here, those same men are playing cards. But he's making some very particular references here. For example, this is the haiku of chemical photography. This is Pear Blossom Highway. This comes after four or five years of working with the camera, where he doesn't use for those four years a pencil, a pen, or any drawing instrument. He uses the camera as a drawing instrument. These are collaged together in the traditional way a collage might be made. Each print being printed individually. There's something like 300 odd photographs in that Pear Blossom Highway image. So this is a reference to the haiku of chemical photography. And now 30 years later, we're looking at what digital photography gives us the opportunity to do. And in here, there's literally hundreds of photographs. This carpet is made up of numerous perspectives. If you begin to spend time with it, you can perhaps begin to decipher it or the placing of the characters. These are made up of dozens of photographs put together. Everything is organized in this way. He pays homage to Cezanne. So this, this particular image has a very interesting connotation to it. I went to the launch of Photoshop mm -hmm. in uh, Silicon Valley in uh, 1990, I think it was. And uh, They'd invited me because of the Pear Blossom Highway. And I went up there with my assistant and I took my two dogs. And uh, anyway, they said if there's two things they don't like in Silicon Valley, it's smokers and dogs. And I said, oh, well, you've got to just uh, accept me now. I've come and that's it. And. Uh, it was, they, they showed it, and I did a bit of it and fiddled with it, and uh, on the way back 
driving back to, uh, to LA, I said, well, that was all about drawing and it's the end of chemical photography. There are artists who explore different uh, technologies and medium in their work, for sure, but I can't think of one in art history, candidly, as inquisitive as this artist. Well, thanks for joining us on Art Loft. You can connect with us anytime on social media at Artloft SFL and watch us anytime on the PBS app by selecting WPBT2 as your local station. For Artloft, I'm Jamani Anamdi. And remember, art imitates life, so do what? Live a beautiful life. Peace. Funding for Artloft was made possible by Friends of Art and In the Florida Keys in Key West, every night is a spectacular show. And every day is another masterpiece. <laughs>